the day of World Cup PH. Check out www.wordcon.ph or email us at wordconph at gmail.com. Magandang araw po sa inyong lahat. Ngayon pong naranasan natin ang napakahabang lockdown, quarantine. Aabot na tayo ng mga patpito, walo, siyam na buwan ng ating quarantine. Nakikita po natin na kailangan na lumakas ang ating kalooban. Hindi lang ang ating katawan, ngunit ang ating kalooban sa pandemic na ito. Mayroon po tayo bilang mga Kristiyano na mga resources in order to strengthen ourselves during times like this. One of the great resources that we have is prayer. Sa pamagitan ng ating panalangin, mas lalo pong lumalakas ang ating kalooban at nakikita natin ang meaningfulness ang pag-asa sa mga pangyayaring ito. At isa pong nakakatulong sa ating panalangin ay ang salita ng Diyos. Sa pamagitan ng salita ng Diyos, natatanggap po natin yung gabay ng Diyos sa ating buhay ngayon. Kaya I congratulate the Claritian Society for continue to bringing out the Bible Diary na makakatulong po sa mga Kristiyano sa araw-araw na pakikiisa sa pagbabasa ng Biblia kasama ng buong simbahan. So I strongly endorse Christians to make use of the Bible Diary 2021 of the Claritian Publications. Ito po sana ay makatulong sa atin, sa ating patuloy na pagninilay at pagsubaybay sa Diyos na hindi nagsasawang magsalita sa atin sa pamamagitan ng Bible. Ang liturgy po ay isang paraan ng simbahan upang araw-araw tayo ay pakainin, palakasin ng salita ng Diyos. Hindi na, di man tayo makakasimba araw-araw, nakikiisa tayo sa gawain sa simbahan, sa mga misa, sa pamamagitan ng pagninilay ng salita ng Diyos. Gamitin niyo po ito, ang Bible Diary 2021. At kung maaari, irigalo ipamahagi sa iba upang kumalat ang ating pagkapit sa salita ng Diyos.
Jay Kuching of the Claritian Missionaries, Director of the Claritian Publications. We have been in the publishing ministry for 40 years and have published more than 2,000 titles. And we've noticed that in every title that we have published, there is a story behind the book that could not be found on the pages. Welcome to Between the Pages, an in-depth look on the author and the story behind the book that can only be found between the pages. Why does our sacramental life fail to inspire genuine Christian discipleship in the church today? Well, I have observed that, you know, despite our inherent religiosity as a people, we're very holy as a people, di ba? Uh, Filipino Catholics go to church on Sundays, punong-puno ang simbahan, namimiss nga nila yung simbahan during the pan pandemic. Uh, and uh, many of us practice uh, pop acts of popular piety, like, you know, attending processions and so on and so on. And yet, despite the fact that we are, be, we are very religious as a people, why do we fail to address some of society's most basic problems, such as social injustice, poverty, human rights, violations, among others? My other two books are more academic and scholarly in approach, although both were written within the Filipino context. This new book, while not compromising scholarly quality, speaks directly to the target audience in the last chapter. Kaya lang baka last chapter lang ang basahin nyo, no? Bas basahin nyo po. Okay? Because that last, that last chapter gives very practical tips or steps in realizing the vision of making our sacramental life inspired genuine Christian discipleship in the world today. My name is Dr. Michael Dimitris H. Assis. I'm a professor at the Ateneo de Manila Theology Department and author of the book, The Shape of the Filipino Church to Come, published by our friendly Claritian Publications. In my 20 years of priesthood, and having had relationship with a lot of people from all walks of life and different age groups, I realized that there is a basic problem of communication that is with themselves and with others. And most of all, communication with God. And that is why I tried to come up with something that could help contemporary men and women on how to communicate with God. And that is writing a prayer book that they could use for their everyday prayers. Now, the prayer book is contemporary in its approach, meaning the language resonates with the new generations. That would be the millennials and the centennials. I guess the alpha generation is too young yet to use the book. However, I also acknowledge the fact that there are a lot of Gen Xers and baby boomers that are also trying to find their way how to talk to God. And that is why we threw in a mix of traditional Catholic prayer. So the book is about the situations, the problems, the questions of the new generations that would be the millennials and the centennials and at the same time, it tries to cater to the deep questions of the Gen Xers and the baby boomers at the same time. Now, the book is an upward movement. Why? Because when a person prays, his or her words go up to heaven. And this movement in sacramental language is anabinoid. 
which is Greek for going up. And the words go up to God, and of course, God meets His creature that prays. So God goes down in a movement that is called katabaino, which is also Greek for going down. So the two movements initiated first by the person that petitions or prays to God meets in the center. And that is where wonder happens. And so the book tries to answer the basic problem of communication between the creature and the creator. And I hope and pray that this book is able to help each and every one, especially the target audiences, which are the millennials and the centennials, as well as the Gen Xers and the baby boomers, to start a wonderful conversation with God. The book has a lot of uh, themes for prayer. And there are a lot of professions that can use the book because we have also composed prayers for particular works such as the veterinarians, the actors, the dentists, the firefighters, you name it. You will find a particular prayer for your profession. And so I invite you to get a book and start your daily conversation with God in a meaningful way. I am Father Jonathan A. Vitoy, CMF, the author of Heart to Heart. It is published by the Clarician Communications Foundation. Here in the Philippines and around the world, we have many devotions connected with Lent and Holy Week. We also have some devotions for Advent and Christmas, but very few devotions for Easter. And to think that the resurrection is the most important mystery of our Christian faith. As Paul says, if Christ had not been raised, then your faith is in vain. It is in light of this that we have this new devotion the Via Lucis, to complement an already popular and well-beloved devotion, the Via Crucis. Taken together, the Via Crucis, the way of the cross, and the way of the resurrection, the Via Lucis, or the way of light, gives us a fuller picture of the Paschal mystery of our Lord Jesus Christ. When this book first came out, a friend of mine shared his experience in the Holy Land. An Orthodox companion of his asked him, Why do you Catholics go here to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre? And he said, It's because this is the place where the Lord suffered and where the Lord was crucified and where the Lord died. And the Orthodox friend remarked, Oh, but we Orthodox, we go here because this is where the Lord rose again. Sadly, some of us Catholics are fixed and stuck with Good Friday. We have a sorrowful faith. But as John Paul II teaches us, we are an Easter people and Alleluia is our song. May this new book, the Via Lucis, help us to enter more deeply into the mystery of the Lord's resurrection so that we can know Him more fully, love Him more deeply, and follow Him more closely. I am Leo Ocampo, author of Via Lucis, published by Claritian Publications.
Welcome to Word Conference 2020. This is the second day. We thank you for your continued presence. Yesterday, we were inspired by the talk of Brother Carl and Dr. Assis and our reactors, Father Raymond and Miss Tina. We thank all of you for actively participating in the conference and the challenging questions you posted to our speakers. Today, the second day, we listen from great scholars, Fathers Alex Gubrin and Jonathan Bitoy and our reactors, Father Anthony Carrion and Mr. Leo Ocampo. May the Word of God, who is Jesus, continue to inspire you today. Our first speaker for this second day is a much-in-demand retreat master, seminar resource person, counselor, and a team building and strategic planning facilitator. He has a licensure in church history at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, Italy. He is currently finishing his dissertation at the Development Academy of the Philippines for his doctorate in educational leadership. He is the author of Heart to Heart, a collection of traditional and new prayer conversations with God published by the Claritian Publications. Friends, please welcome Father Jose Jonathan A. Bitoy, Sim. Good morning, everyone. I'm here standing in front of you to reflect on the Word of God in times of pandemics. And I will do that so that we could have certain shared reflections later on and come up with possible uh, integration of our own personal interaction with the Word. Now, by way of introduction, the Philippines is a country of predominantly religious people. Irregardless of the faith they profess, it cannot be denied that a faith response is inevitably a majority of Filipinos' response. In times of trials and tribulations, like recent calamities, is people turning to God for help and succor. And they would say that human helps are part of God's intervention. And part of our response is a closer reading of the Word of God. And that is, we see that what's happening to us at the present are transitory and a better future awaits all of us. The quad media, for example, that is TV, radio, phone, and internet are replete with the sharing of the Word of God to some and to someone and anyone. My own social media alone is flooded with a deluge of quotes, verses, and paraphrases from the Bible, not to mention the countless prayers, promises, reflections on the outcome of the pandemic that are sent and recycled by everyone. Thus, the Word takes prominent stage in the COVID-19 pandemic that affected the world. It is this phenomenon that this talk wishes to explore and draw some insights into the faith response that has always accompanied the Christian group since its conception. So, my approach will be historical, phenomenological, and theological. So, why historical? Because I want to situate our own faith response to the Word of God to that of the experiences of our early Christian brethren, the so-called uh, ancestors of the faith. It's important that we know how they respond to God's Word in times of their own stressful moments so that we will also understand why we are doing the same thing or differently at the present time. Phenomenological because I want it to be evidence-based, meaning it is not something that I imagined in my mind or what I think is happening, but something that is concretely happening during those times. Theological because we want to put a grounding to all the empirical evidences that we have called from history and from our present experiences so that there is something more. It is not just a laundry list of what had happened or a narration of the obvious, but there is deep insight into those experiences. So, 
Let me say that from the onset of Christianity, the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ was a source of strength of the early followers. They gathered to pray and worship in the temple in Jerusalem. Mind you, they did not think of themselves as something separate from the Jewish faith. They thought of themselves as faithful Jewish, uh, you know, uh, faithful Jews, and that they are doing God's will. So the apostles headquartered in Jerusalem, thinking that Jesus will come soon. So there is an apocalyptic expectation even in the early groups that had followed the Lord. So it is in Jerusalem that they stayed, they prayed, and waited for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, which they thought would be soon. Later, amidst persecutions, where they are first evicted from the temple worship. Why is that so? Because they thought of themselves as Jews. They are not a separate religion or a sect. But Jewish temple authorities think that they are a sect within Judaism and that they are not orthodox but heretical. So they were sent out from temple worship and that gave rise to the house churches or the Dumas Ecclesia and actively persecuted to the point of death the early followers of Jesus Christ. We can see that in the case of Stephen and later state-sponsored persecution that led to countless martyrs among the followers of Jesus. The word sustained the faith of the suffering Christians. Now, the word at the time are oral traditions, although the writings of St. Paul are already circulating in some of the writings of the Apostles. The, uh, the Gospels, as we know now, Matthew, Mark, uh, Luke, and John, are still in the process of being written. So when we say the word, it is their active memory of Jesus Christ. So it is this that nourished the faith of the suffering Christians increasing their number rather than diminishing it. So there, you will see at once the power of the Word. It gave meaning to their sufferings. It also gave them hope that all will come to pass. It is in this context that a type of literature developed which was during the Old Testament times. No, so. It harks back to the Old Testament times. And it came back to give Christians comfort and sustain their hope and courage. And what is this literature? This literature is said to be apocalyptic literature. These were written to give the suffering Christian community to bear their suffering patiently, explaining the meaning of their hardships. So this apocalyptic literature is a genre of writing and that is not only exclusive to the Jews or Christians. It, also present, it is also present in some oldest religious movements that preceded even the Jewish and Christian faith. This can be found in Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, folk religions of the Indians in the Americas, the Incans and the Aztec religions, Zoroastrianism, the Vikings, Egyptians, and countless other faiths. So this is not something that we invented. Its main function is to assure that a new start will happen when the present becomes too heavy to bear. The change will be accompanied by sufferings, but the righteous need not fear. So in the Christian tradition, apocalyptic literature arose to give the persecuted Christians hope that the future in store for them is glorious, something that is different from their present predicament. God will triumph in the end and usher a new age, a new heaven, and a new earth will come. So fast forward. The same comfort and assurance is provided by the Word, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic and the different natural and man-made calamities that beset the country. So we are localizing the reflection 
only in our country, the Philippines. This time, the word is now codified, systematized, and heard and conserved by the church. And is officially declared that these are the inspired words of God. This is especially true in the Philippine setting. First, the bishops issued pastoral letters comforting the flock with the word of God. Church mobilized to as much as possible provide pastoral and spiritual care in the new normal dictated by the pandemic. And religious groups began an intensified reading and sharing of the word to provide spiritual comfort to their brethren. Individual persons began to take it to themselves to share the word of God in social media to strengthen one another. There are those who emphasize the positive outcome of these stressful events. They choose to see the silver lining of the dark clouds that cover the sun. For example, they would point to the healing of the environment, that is, clearer skies because of pollution-free atmosphere, some would even say that the ozone layer is healing and that rivers and seas are recovering because there is not much pollutant around. Essentially, nature is healing itself. And families to discover the joy of family time. No? And those saddled with many activities learn to relish the me time that was forced on them by the pandemic. People become more kind, helping one another in the shared suffering. The rich become more sensitive. You have seen how the richest in the Philippines have shared whatever they have. They gave more during the times of pandemic. The biggest businesses, they didn't care much for their uh, losses. What they wanted is to help as much as possible the suffering Filipinos. And it was a good sight to behold. Former businessmen and businesswomen, only thinking of profit, now put premium to life rather than to the money that they would have otherwise saved for themselves. There was less looting at that time, and this is something extraordinary, or theft during the lockdown. There was not even a price increase. Okay? Commodities were under control, and so people, even if they suffered, does not suffer that much because the suffering was not compounded by human-made suffering. Church led relief drive triumphed in partnership with private groups and businesses. This is something funny. They would rather channel their helps to church or religious organizations. Why? Because their network at times are more reliable than that of the government because of the church's grassroots experience. And their relief operation technology is sometimes far superior than that of government agency. Because you will hear horror stories of relief goods handed over to the government and it was just stored there and languished for several months until they expire. Why? There is not much coordination. They do not even know whom to, whom to give it. And the squabbling between government officials who otherwise would like to be the lead in the giving away of relief. And that compounded the problem of government-led relief operations. It's their lack of being uh, in harmony with one another or that they did not coordinate with one another. While others emphasize the darker side of these events, they recall the more sinister aspect of apocalyptics, that is destruction, punishment, and suffering. A more intense reading of Revelation with its description of punishments, of plagues, war, famine, and natural calamities 
delighted some groups who relished these grim scenarios and they weaponized them to terrorize others, to repent, to fear God, and just to change their ways. So, their way of evangelizing is through fear. Well, the first group emphasizes more the positive side of what is happening, read in the light of God's Word. So, what we have here is two ways of reading. And it's a good thing that when these apocalyptic groups began to post their own, you know, uh, fears of the impending uh, end of the world. It's a good thing that in the early stage of the pandemic, where everyone felt the difficulty of the imposed lockdown, there was no major natural disaster and calamities that occurred. Why? Because it could have exacerbated the situation and convinced many that the end of the world with its disastrous implication is near. Imagine if in the midst of the pandemic there would have been there would be earthquake or there would be flash floods or there would be break out of fire in the metropolis. What would people think? God is really punishing humanity. And many could have been driven insane due to fear, hopelessness, and powerlessness to confront the imagined situation. Amidst this opposing reading of the word, the positive and negative readings, I now therefore propose a revisit of the apocalyptic biblical literature so that we will have no one's appreciation of its message. So first, apocalyptic literature and the pandemic in calamities. So, what is apocalyptic literature? As I said, it is a form of writing that was developed first in the Old Testament especially when Israel was confronted with difficult times, like they were exiled, their land was conquered by foreign invaders, their temples destroyed. And so, they began to yearn for a much better place for themselves and for their children. And so, they developed the literature to say that that these things will pass. So, it is a message of comfort for them. Just try to remain faithful to God. Everything will pass. Your suffering is transitory. Secondly, they assure themselves that God is in control of everything. There might be temporary chaos, a disturbance in their environment, an uprootment, of their lives they were taken from a faraway place even their livelihood was destroyed families torn apart and separated from one another yet it does not mean that god abandoned them in the apocalyptic literature in the end it is the will of god that will triumph so it shows that God is in control and therefore their belief is something that is not, you know, uh, it is not important. Their belief is important because they know that God in the end will take control. Apocalyptic literature promises a better things to come. To sum it up, it says that a new heaven and a new earth will dawn. So the old order will pass away. So all the corruption, all the oppression, all the inequality, all that is heavy to bear, and all that is immoral, they will be destroyed. And a new heaven and a new earth that is in conformity with God's will will come. And the last word of the apocalyptic literature is always about hope. If you have a close reading, even of Revelation, 
after the prophesied, you know, evil times, and then the suffering of God's people, then in the end, God will come triumphantly to put order to chaos, and that a new order will come, and therefore stand fast and await the coming of your Savior. In a word, it says that when Jesus Christ comes again in His glory, stand up, hold your head high, and welcome the coming of your King. So, where is fear in there? The last message of Apocalyptic is always about hope. It is not about punishment. And those who would fear the Apocalypse that is to come are not the righteous people. It is the evil people because it is their machinations, it is their human-made order of society, it is their lifestyle that will be destroyed. It is not the soul of the believer, but all the evil structures that was in place before Jesus Christ will come back again in His glory. And so, to sum it up, the Word of God played an important part in the life of the Christian people in good times and in bad. At this present time, where we are still uh, having the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are in a bad time. But how did we cope up? First, the Word of God accompanied us on different levels. On the individual level, people began an intense reading of God's Word to find meaning to the suffering that we have. On the social level, religious groups or the church, they began to look at the Word of God for comfort and hope. And that is why the bishops, the pastors, they provided leadership on this. They guided the suffering flock and the priests too. In their pastoral care for their flock, they are able to somehow ease up the otherwise unbearable burden of the pandemic. And then, later on, people began to share what they have personally uh, you know, imbibed from the Word or that which they have you know, reflected upon to others. Others would build up on that and share it to others. Church documents are now you know, consulted especially the Bible, and it is shared in social media. That's why it spread and it reached a large number of people, especially those who have access to social media or the quad media. I'm talking about the television, radio, uh, phone, and then the internet. Okay. Then... Because of this, two ways of reading the Word of God came out. First, those who are emphasizing the positive side of the experience that we have and reflecting it on the light of God's Word. And those who are emphasizing the negative side and summoning up the more sinister aspect of the end of time scenario. And because of these two opposing readings, we come up with a proposal that we need to have a sober appreciation of the Word. And what did we do? First, we recounted that apocalyptic literature is a genre, a style of writing. It is not about prophecy of what will come in the future or a detailed uh, explanation or what is going to happen at the end of time. It is a literary genre which uses, uh, you know, it uses words that are, you know, creative. It uses uh, words that are not literal. Okay. So, 
when it says that the earth will be shaken. It is not a literal shaking of the earth, but perhaps what structures the earth has, especially those not in conformity with God, will be shaken, will be finally destroyed. And so the language to use is something, uh, you know, uh, something that refers to a destruction of the order. In this case, it is the destruction of the old order. So, apocalyptic literature is a literary style of writing which uses words that are not literal in its meaning, but rather it has a deeper creative meaning. And secondly, the intent was not to put fear of the Lord to the recipient, but rather to give them comfort and hope to assure them that God is in control, that a better future awaits them, and therefore they are not supposed to be afraid, especially if they are followers of God, the righteous ones of God. And then thirdly, that apocalyptic literature should be summoned by the individual or by a group, in this case the Catholic Church, not to put God's fear and forcefully make people repent and change their ways, but in order to give us stability of mind and heart that we will not fear because the last message of God's Word is always about hope. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Father Jonathan Bitoy. Now we will hear from Mr. Leo Ocampo. Our reactor is Leo Martin Angelo R. Ocampo. He is a professed lay Dominican of the Sanctus Dominicus Lay Dominican Fraternity based in the University of Santo Tomas. He is a faculty member of the Institute of Religion and Academic Collaborators Officer of the Ecclesiastical Faculties at the Pontifical and Royal University of Santo Tomas, where he is also taking up doctoral studies major in theology. He is the author of Via Lucis, Way of Light, Reflections and Prayers published by the Clarician Publications. Good morning everyone. First of all, allow me to thank Father Jonathan Bitoy for that wonderful sharing. If there is one word that stuck to me from his sharing, it would be the word apocalypse, a very familiar scene nowadays one calamity and pestilence after another. And as if COVID-19 was, was not enough, we just underwent a slew of earthquakes, storms, floods, famine and hunger everywhere, war and destruction. There's even a woman fighting a dragon, spewing flames. Para bang ang buong mundo mo ay unti-unting gumuguho, at nagugunaw, as if everything is falling apart. Armageddon, a very frightening sight indeed. It's a great comfort, Father assured us, all of this is not to be taken literally. Allow me now to expand a little on the reflection we just heard. So what is the word that God speaks to us in this pandemic? Brothers and sisters, it is very difficult to speak to someone in pandemic, to someone experiencing apocalypse, to someone whose world seems to collapse. What do you say to someone who just closed a business, lost a livelihood, or even a loved one? According to the prophet Isaiah, the Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I may know how to sustain a word him who is weary, or with the word, him who is weary. How do you sustain the weary with the word? We humans often do not know how. Frequently in the face of suffering, we act like the friends of Job, bringing even more pain, darkness, and confusion than comfort, life, light, and hope. In situations like this, Anything we say would tend to sound stupid. For example, you can say in Tagalog, 
Okay lang yan. No, that's okay. You lost a loved one. Can you say that? Bakit kung mas okay yata kung sa'yo nangyari? No, you can say, don't worry, magiging maayos rin ng lahat. And maybe you will hear, we, sure ka? No, and you will say, God has a plan. And is this a part of it? No, there are no words that will be adequate to comfort and to heal. So what will God himself say then? What will he say to someone who is in pandemic, in apocalypse, in collapse? If we will read and reflect on the gospel, we realize God does not say much. In the, instead, he does something. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word of God during this pandemic is not a clause but compassion to suffer with. Not many sentences but sincerity. Not a long paragraph but presence. Not a sermon but sympathy. The word of God in pandemic is a word with the capital W. Not a what but a who. The Word is no other than Jesus, the incarnate Word. Now, how does Jesus bring comfort to the weary? The book of Hebrews, on which you are reflecting during this word conference, says, The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. This is true of every word of God, but truest about Jesus, the word of God. The word is powerful and dynamic, like a two-edged sword. It has a push and a pull. First, it has the pull of attraction. Remember how attractive Jesus was? He was just an ordinary carpenter and yet, he captivated crowds of followers. Everyone who encountered him felt the grace and the mercy of God, except those with proud hearts. Jesus is magnetic. You will be attracted to him, and this attraction will change your life. Pag namagnet ka ni Jesus at dumikit ka kay Jesus, mababago ka niya. You cannot help but be transformed. Remember Magdalene with seven demons, Peter who was so stubborn and cowardly, and many more. And after attracting and transforming his disciples, he now sends them out and pushes them outward in mission. So merong pull of attraction and meron din push of mission. And the same is true with us in this time of pandemic. In the Old Testament, when the people of God in the desert were being plagued by snakes, the Lord ordered Moses to fashion a bronze serpent and mount it on a pole. And all who looked upon the bronze serpent were saved. This is clearly a prefiguration, as the fathers of the church point out to us, of Jesus on the cross and how we need to look upon him whom we have pierced. We need to fix to, we need to fix our eyes upon Jesus in order to live. In this time of pandemic, it's, it is so easy to lose heart. But the only way to survive is to allow ourselves to be pulled by Jesus, to be attracted by Him, to stay close to Him despite our doubts and fears, and slowly to allow ourselves to be transformed by Him, empowered by Him, and sent by Him in mission. Kaya nga, thank you, Father Jonathan, for encouraging us to turn to the Word of God, to turn to the Word Himself, as the early Christian communities did in this difficult time, in their own difficult time. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus, especially when we are losing hope. And what about the mission? Tumulong, magbahagi, magbigay, and what if I have nothing more to give, nothing more to do? I lost my job, my business, my loved ones. What more can I give? 
I have given all. Like Jesus on the cross, I can say everything is finished. No, my dear brothers and sisters, I pri our primary mission is not to help or to share or to give. Our real mission is to love. Sabi nga ni St. Therese, my vocation is love. Without love, even the things that we give and do will be meaningless. But with love, even the smallest things become meaningful and attractive. And love can take on many forms. But above all, it takes the form of a word to the weary. And what is this word? Not a clause, but compassion. Not many sentences, but sincerity. Not long paragraphs, but presence. Not a sermon, but sympathy. Nothing but Jesus, the incarnate word, the incarnate love of God. Sabi nga ni Father, it can be as simple as sharing good words and good thoughts on social media or sending a private message to someone who needs cheering up and encouragement to be the presence of Jesus today. Brothers and sisters, this is the sacrificium laudis that we are called to offer, the sacrifice of praise. The book of Hebrews tells us, Offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Offer your compassion, sincerity, presence, and sympathy to those in need. Kahit minsan ikaw mismo, walang wala na. Offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Offer your love. Offer Jesus. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Father Jonathan Bitoy and Mr. Leo Ocampo. We'd like to request our participants to kindly hold on to your questions as our speakers and reactors will address this during the sala. The sala will follow after the talk of Father Alex Gubrin and the reaction of Father Anthony Carrion. We will now have a five-minute break. Sandali, pinakahihintay ay ang marini ang yung tini sumisikaw at imbibib sa labis na pananabik mga anghel ay nagiliwang sa palasyo mo ang tunganda. Ang aking na ang magising upang magkampan ang nangyay. Salamat sa pagdaloy mo sa oras na ito. Sa tinig mo'y makikinig ako. Sandali, pinakahihintay Ay ang marindi Ang tinig mo Sumisikaw Aking dipib Sa labis na Pananabik Mga anghel Ay nagiriwang Sa palasyo mo Anong ganda Ang atong na ang magising upang makamtan ang langit Salamat sa pagdaloy mo sa oras na ito Sa tinig mo'y makikinig ako 
salamat sa pagdaling mo sa oras na ito. At pasan din Mawawala Nang kay Pilip Sa santaling Kapiling ko'y Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my past. Ang yung salita ay liwanag sa aking mga paa, tanglaw sa aking mga landas. Isa sa mga mahalagang katotohanan na ranasan natin ang kahalagaan sa panahon ng pandemya ang pagninilay sa salita ng Diyos. Dahil sa ating pagninilay, makakahugot tayo ng lakas, pag-asa at sa gitna ng kadiliman tayo ay may liwanag sa salita ng Diyos. Kaya inanyahan ko kayong bumili ng Bible Diary 2021. At isang mahalagang regalo ito para sa inyong mga kaibigan para magkaroon silang pagkakataon, magbasa at magnilay sa salita ng Diyos. Get a copy of Bible Diary 2021. Ako niyong likod, si Bishop Ness Ongtioko, Obispo ng Diocese of Cubano.
Our next speaker has been into biblical studies and ministries for almost 30 years. He has a license shape in theology, biblical section at the Pontifical University of Santo Tomas Angelicum, Rome in Italy. He is now pursuing his doctoral degree at the same university. He teaches biblical studies at the Institute of Consecrated Life in Asia. Currently, he is a board member of the Catholic Biblical Association of the Philippines and consultant of the Episcopal Commission on Biblical Apostolate. Friends, please welcome Father Alejandro Alex Guprin, CMF. Good morning and welcome. I am Father Alex Gubrin and I would like to share to you my reflections on the issue on Hebrews as an invitation to sacrifice of praise. The experience of pandemic urges us to reframe our worldviews, our existential life, our faith, our ethics, our relationships with the self, with God, and with others, and the entire creation. Indeed, the paradigm shifts in theology were triggered not only by big new ideas, but mostly because of historical events. In this challenge of reframing, we do not start from nothing. We have enormous number of sources to begin with. The lessons we have learned from our own experiences, or we call that traditions, and the Word of God, the scriptures that guided us along in our journey. Indeed, God is ever active in our history and is always creating in us the dream of fullness and harmony. Today we ask this question more strongly. Can faith grow and still be nourished even if we do not have complete access to our sacred space, the church? Even if we only have limited access to our sacred agents, the priests, even if we only have limited access to our sacred time, the Eucharist, fiesta celebrations, and other public rites. This question actually is not new. The prophet Daniel, in his time, lamented. We have in our day no prince, prophet or leader, no burnt offering, sacrifice, oblation, or incense, no place to offer first fruits, to find favor with you. He was lamenting actually in the lack of or the absence of the sacred space, the sacred persons, sacred time and public rights. I would like to share with you one of the sources or treasures that we can start with in this reframing in the area of faith, crisis, and worship. The book of the Hebrews or the letter to the Hebrews you might, you might ask, why the Hebrews? Truly, Hebrews is not known to many. Unlike the other experiences or faith experiences of the Bible, it is seldom used in the liturgical celebrations or in Sunday liturgy. It is not an easy reading most people find it difficult to understand, yet Hebrews can teach us, confront our crisis, and can help us find steps in reframing our faith and worship. 
Interestingly, we hear the text of the Hebrews every Good Friday celebration. This may be an indication that its message is always active, especially in times of trouble. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16 and Hebrews 5, 7 to 9. It says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who has similar, similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when he was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was here because of his reverence. Zan, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The context. The context of the Hebrews is very near, very close to us. During these times when our expressions of faith, liturgical celebrations and worship is limited, Hebrews can encourage us, can suggest to us ways to keep our faith stronger and even stronger. The Christian communities associated with the Hebrews, probably Jewish, since the author presupposes a strong Old Testament knowledge from his audience, are confronting with a difficult moment. The exhortations, for example, of the author carefully described the painful conditions of his community. In Hebrews 12, verses 12 to 13, it says, so strengthen your dropping hands and your weak knees. Make straight paths for your feet that what is lame may not be dislocated but healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for that holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Hebrews 12, 12-13 The community might have grown lax in their faith. Hebrews 10, 25 The delay of the final return of Jesus, the Christ, may have demoralized the community. Hebrews 10, 25 and verses 35-39 there are also reports of imprisonments and confiscations of properties, Hebrews 10.34, persecution, Hebrews 10.33, hostility, Hebrews 12.3, and torture, Hebrews 13.3. They were subject to public abuse and ridicule, Hebrews 10.33. And this is very strong in the Mediterranean world where values are governed by honor and shame. The importance of the theme on cult in the book of the Hebrews may also indicate a strong felt need among the readers for a more adequate liturgical and ritual life. Other religions have religious traditions and may have a more attractive cultic practice that provides sense of identity and security. 
while others have temple, the sacred space, the Hebrews do not have. While others have calendar of celebrations, sacred time, the Hebrews do not have. While others have feasts, public rites, the Hebrews do not have. While others have priests, sacred persons, the Hebrews do not have. These are clear issues of we might call identity crisis, but there may be some social bearing on it. They may have to endure shame, ridicule, and suffering dishonor as followers of the one who embraced the shame and dishonor of the cross. Hebrews 12, verse 2. The authors move. In this context, the author has to respond to this pastoral concern as a disciple and as a leader. Hebrews 2 verse 3 and 13 verse 17. This leader, this disciple who has the obligation to remind, to instruct, to warn, and encourage his brothers and sisters. In doing so, the author crafted one of the most eloquent reflections on Jesus and his act of redemption. The author knew that what was needed were not improved structures or social strategies, but rather a more complete Christology. Inadequate Christology lies at the very center of the crisis. Maybe their Christology was too high that they cannot seem to acknowledge Jesus as in solidarity with human suffering and fragility, or maybe their Christology is too low that they cannot seem to perceive how Jesus can mediate with the Divine God on our behalf. I looked on the Hebrews. It might be benefiting or it might benefit us to take a tour on Hebrews in order to decipher some Christological reframing as response to the crisis in Hebrews. As the audience of the Hebrews were strongly knowledgeable of the Old Testament, especially the Torah, the author used the Old Testament framework to work on his arguments. Here we will use the dynamic interplay of exposition and exhortation used in the text. The Hebrews starts with exposition, a statement of faith that the Son is superior to angels, then moves to exhortation. Therefore, the Hebrews has to listen carefully, the community has to listen carefully. Then moves to exposition again, the Son lower than angels, this is low Christology, he became as we are a faithful and merciful high priest, but superior to Moses. Then it moves to exhortation that talks about faithless people, a failure to enter God's rest. God's rest is still available, God's word still active, that is why <clears throat> we have to hold fast and draw near. It moves again to exposition, Christ qualified as high priest and it exhorts a call for maturity a stern warning with hope and the grounding of our hope moves again to exposition in chapter 7 Christ and Melchizedek Jesus is not from the line of the Aaronite priests which who are representatives of the people and fragile, but rather from the line of Melchizedek, a king, a priest superior to the Levites, a new priesthood confirmed by God's oath, and Christ is the eternal high priest. Christ's high priestly ministry, okay, this Christ's sanctuary, Christ's covenant, Christ's sacrifice, 
the old and the new sacrifice, the sacrifice and the new covenant, the new and the final sacrifice. In Jesus, we have the ultimate sacrifice. Moves to exhortation again in chapter 10, 19 to chapter 13, 25. A call to fidelity and mutuality. Mutuality. Learning from the past. The meaning of faith from the experience of creation to Noah, from Sarah to Abraham to Joseph, from Moses and Israel, from the prophets and the martyrs. All of these experiences are present and fulfilled in the Christians. It moves to the call of fidelity and mutuality to continue in faith. It looks to Jesus. Reg uh, regards suffering as discipline, regain, regaining strength, and being one. And then the final exhortations. It presents Zion, the unshakable kingdom. It presents life and faith in the community, mutual duties, examples to follow Christ's sacrifice, and speaks about leaders, and finally, benediction, doxology, greetings, and farewell. All of this is to show that Jesus is superior. That's high Christology. Superior than the experiences of Abraham, Moses, and all these people and all their experiences. But, that's high Christology. But, in Jesus, who suffered for us, who is God's humility, and that is low Christology. So, the Hebrews, the, the, the book of the Hebrews elevates Jesus in order that all this Old Testament theology collapses in, in the person of Jesus and his act of redemption. Jesus, God's word, hope for new creation, eternal priest, and the uh, ultimate sacrifice. The book of the Hebrews, as I have said, elevates Jesus as superior, but it also challenges the followers to be faithful and to hold on to their faith despite of the crisis that they were undergoing. A closer look to, look to on the, the text. In chapter 13, verse 9, it says, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teaching. It is good to have our hearts strengthened by the grace and not by fools, which do not benefit those who live by them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. The bodies of the animals whose blood the high priest brings into the sanctuary as a sin offering are burned outside the camp. Notice, therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the gate to consecrate the people by his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the reproach that he bore. For here we have no lasting city but we seek the one that is to come. Through him, then let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of lips that confess his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. God is pleased by sacrifices of that kind. This unit belongs to the final exhortations that sketch the appropriate lifestyle for an acceptable worship mentioned in Hebrews 12.28. Worship is the means by which we draw near to God in the present life. Worship acceptable to God is an act of gratitude, reverence, and awe. Hebrews 13 9 to 16 revisits the sacrifice of Jesus. The altar may not refer directly to the Eucharistic table, but rather 
to the sacrifice of Jesus. The priestly work of Jesus is his death on the cross and his continuing intercession before God on our behalf. Through Jesus and confessing his name, we offer God a sacrifice of praise. So, the sacred space, temple, is reframed. The sacred time, calendar, is reframed. The public rites or feasts are reframed. The persons, the priests, are reframed. All collapses in Jesus and his ultimate sacrifice. In the context of dishonor, ridicule, and public abuse, confessing the name of Jesus, the one who through suffering provided access to God is a clear demonstration of conviction and boldness appropriate for the people of God. Yet, there is another sacrifice to be done. Doing good, eopoeia, the only use of this word in the scripture, and sharing, koinonia. These two are concrete elaboration of a sacrifice pleasing to God. Sacrifice accept acceptable to God with reverence and awe. By way of conclusion, at the beginning of this conference we ask, does faith can grow and still be nourished even if we do not have complete access to our sacred space, the church? Even if we do not have or we have a limited access to our sacred agents, the priests? Even if we only have limited access to our sacred time, Eucharist, celebrations, and public rites? The answer from the Hebrews is yes. The author of the book resolves to reframe the Christology of his audience and thus reframe too their approach to God, that is worship and spirituality. Accompanying a community beset with difficulties, the author of the Hebrews presents solution not on the grounds of improving structures or strategies, social strategies. The author resolves to present a reframing of Christology in order to respond to the crisis. All Old Testament theology, especially Torah, collapses in Jesus. Jesus is superior and the right intercessor to God on our behalf. His once and for all sacrifice did it all. The abode of God is sacred space Jesus is our sacred agent. The altar where we are received by God and where we receive grace from God, Jesus' sacrifice is our ultimate sacrifice. What is our task? Our task now is to offer continually a sacrifice of praise and kindness to others. Listen to this. Let us go then to Him outside the camp bearing the reproach he bore for here we have no lasting city but we seek the one that is to come through him then let us continually offer to god a sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of lips that confess his name do not neglect to do good and to share what you have god is pleased by sacrifices of that kind. Therefore, Hebrews 13, 15 to 16 joins words of praise and generosity together as continuing worship that is acceptable and pleasing to God. Uniting words of praise and deeds of generosity into a cultic act is encouraging. Word of praise and acts of kindness together, they are sacrifices pleasing to God. In these trying times of difficulties, of pandemic and catastrophes, we might be asked to reframe our understanding and faith in Jesus. And so, reframe to our offering of sacrifice to God. Thank you and God bless. 
Thank you very much, Father Alex Gubrin. Now we will hear from the reactor, Father Anthony Carrion. Our reactor is Father Anthony Carrion, CMF. He's a Clarician missionary and an associate member of the Catholic Bible Association of the Philippines. Currently, he serves as house parish administrator and parochial vicar of San Antonio Maria Claret Parish in the Diocese of Navaliches. When I was a postulant in 1997, the word focus was considered to be our patches mantra. Focus in everything we do, but most importantly, focus on Jesus Christ, who we are intending to follow. There is a need to keep our eyes on the Lord, not to lose sight of Him in our daily experiences whether good or bad, in the people we encounter every day, and most especially in our encounter with the Word. At that early stage of our formation, our director was able to instill in us a lesson from the letter to the Hebrews. Failure to listen to the scriptures can make one lose heart and defect to his or her faith. Father Alejandro Gobring, our speaker for today, was my postulate director, and now his student is tasked to give a reaction to his presentation on chapter 13, verse 15 of the letter to the Hebrews, an invitation to sacrifice of praise. Father Alex has provided us a concise exegesis of the text. He dealt on the world behind the text and the world of the text. Now, it is my turn to reflect on the world in front of the text, or how the interpretation of the text relates to our present social context. The primary concern of the letter to the Hebrews author is about faith in Jesus because of a problem with apostasy in the community to whom Hebrews was originally addressed. With the pandemic, some people are losing heart and faith. There are questions that remain unanswered. We feel that God is so distant to us during trying times. Because of weariness, so it is difficult to praise and worship God in the midst of problems brought about by the COVID-19. I affirm Father Alex's input today, and I would simply wish to complement it with concrete ways on how we can reframe our faith in the light of the letter to the Hebrews. In our experience as Catholics, the Church, the Holy Eucharist, and priests serve as agents in strengthening our faith, especially in times of crisis. But now that everything is limited, as Father Alex has mentioned, there is a need to reframe all of these in order to protect and preserve our Christian faith, just like what Hebrews did. We, as pilgrims on the road of life, is being offered by Hebrews a message of hope and encouragement. It challenges us as a church to practically and concretely reframe our conceptions of faith, church, and God. In doing so, no matter what temptations we face, we always have the image of the very human Jesus to fall back on. The Church and Holy Eucharist the celebration of the Holy Eucharist is vital in our life and faith 
as Catholics. In our catechism, it is the highest form of prayer and worship. Nowadays, because of the imposed protocols issued by the government, not everybody can go to the church and attend Mass, even though the faithful is dispensed from attending physical Mass and offered virtual online Masses instead, one could hear from devout Catholics that there is a feeling of incompleteness and emptiness because they cannot receive the body of Christ. Many would comment, Iba pa rin ang totoong misa. Hearing this, it seems that for others, online Mass is not sufficient at all. The grace of God in the Holy Eucharist may feel incomplete without the Holy Communion. How do we enrich our faith through the Eucharist? when there is a physical limitation. First, we can go back to the experience of the early Christians. Even though they were in hiding and a lot of them were persecuted, this did not hinder them from praising God and remembering Jesus Christ. Even in secrecy, they continued to keep the spirit of community by sharing the word and being true witnesses. In their experiences as a community, they are keeping the word alive. They are also keeping their faith alive. This is the beginning of the aspect of the Holy Eucharist as a communal gathering. The family is our domestic church. It is our first church, as this is where we hopefully first encountered the Word, sacraments, and the mission. If we will closely look at our situation, the online Masses should complement the Catechism within families. How many of the families today still talk about faith? and the Word of God after their online Masses celebration. Maybe our young people find it embarrassing. However, it is timely to consider being more in-depth with our faith and be bolder in bringing the spiritual dimension of our person, even without the Church as a structure and the Eucharist as a physical gathering. For instance, the dinner table can be a place for the exchange of stories, sharing of food, and being present with each family member. Isn't this scenario familiar to that of the Eucharist? Even the whole church is adjusting to this new normal when it comes to keeping the Word of God alive. Technology has played a huge role in our attempt to be relevant in the lives of the faithful. Our social media accounts should be maximized to keep the faithful aligned to the Word of God. There are a lot of efforts in terms of social media presence there are churches that hold virtual gatherings, retreats, reflections, and sharing of the Word. It is a huge challenge for all of us, but it is not impossible. This pandemic, it is significant to stress on the real meaning of being a church. Church is not simply a structure that we go to. The church is a presence of a community who are journeying together towards Christ. The priest. 
As Father Alex mentioned, the agent in a community plays a vital role in living the Word. The pandemic made us ask, are priests still relevant given the limitation of masses and the sacraments? Let us go back to the letter to the Hebrews, as it stresses Jesus as a priest. They looked at Jesus not as a primary celebrant of rituals, but they saw Jesus as he offered his life to us. To respond to the challenge of reframing as a priest, we have to understand that Jesus' priesthood is based on two premises. Relationship with God, in which Christ has proven himself faithful, and relationship with humanity, in which he has proven himself to be compassionate. Being a priest is not contained to the house of worship, but his whole life is about the offering of oneself for God and humanity. A priest's offering of oneself goes beyond singing of praise, praying, and celebrating the Mass. Our offering lies on the denying of oneself and offering what the community needs in this time of pandemic. It is good to reflect on this idea through the gospel about the poor widow who offered all of her money to the temple. No matter how small her offering is, it costs her her life. The same way, we are all called to respond to the challenge of the pandemic, that the priestly vocation of Jesus is not simply limited to be lived out by the ordained priests, but for all of us. We are called to truly offer what we have for the community. They said that when you truly give, it will hurt a little. You will feel the loss, but if it gains the life of another, we are then entering a life of offering, a life of being a priest. Aside from donating financially, giving what we have to those in need, and caring for the ones who are physically suffering, there are also other ways that we can do. Listening to a friend, spending time with our family, no matter how busy we are, giving anything that you have without expecting recognition or returns, and actively engaging in relevant issues of the society are ways in which we can offer ourselves. Now, let us go back to the question, is being a priest relevant in our current situation? The answer would be yes. Let us deepen the sense of our priestly vocation, respond to the needs of the times, live a life of self-offering. This is how the Hebrews saw Jesus as a priest. This is how we follow Jesus' life of offering and sacrifice. To conclude this, I have given three points in this reaction. Reframing our faith, the scriptures, and Jesus' priesthood. Jesus is the focus of each detail. The letter to the Hebrews is an exhortation or sermon. It is a written anecdote of the leader's preaching. Maybe that is how I also intend to deliver this reaction as to how I would speak to the faithful during my homily. This is what the letter to the Hebrews is about. It speaks of rootedness in Christ, but fruitfulness 
for the community. I admire Father Alex's discussion today and it challenges me to reframe my focus in the church's relevance to us. I hope it challenges you too. After this reaction, I am then called to action and I hope you are too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father Alex Gubrin and Father Anthony Carion. In a few moments, we will now have our sala. May we request everybody to prepare your questions and type in your questions at the comment boxes. This sala will be moderated by Ms. Charo Garcia.
dress code. What to do on the day of WorldCon PH? Check out www.wordcon.ph or email us at wordconph at gmail.com. Good morning everyone and welcome back to the WordCon. We also welcome back live our two speakers and two reactors, Father Jonathan Bitoy and Father Alex Gobrin, and our reactors, Mr. Leo and Father Anthony. The sala is now open for your questions. Again, I would like to repeat for those who are with us in Zoom, please write your questions in the chat box. Identify yourself, where you're from, and to whom you address your questions. If you're joining us on FB Live, 
and YouTube, you can write your questions in the comments section. Thank you. For our first question, which is addressed to Father Jonathan from Father Angelito Ancla, CMF. In the light of the apocalyptic literatures, what mindsets and attitudes must we emphasize and develop so that we can face this pandemic more realistically and effectively? I would advocate a biblical approach in facing the pandemic. That is, first, the prophets of old, they first speak what is the real situation of the time. They do not water it. They make their own critique of whatever is wrong in the system that is at the present time. So we need to have courage in order to speak the truth, especially now that truth seems to be a lonely word. Many people dilute it with many tactics. The dilution of the truth is now even in the hyperspace you know, with many trolls trying to give us false informations, misleading people. So prophets must come to fore in order to speak the truth. But it is not only critiquing what is wrong with the present time, but also giving people hope. Because if you look at the prophetic utterances of the past, it always ends up with hope. It, must, it does not dwell on the negative, nor on the sinister, nor on punishments and the breakdown of order. It speaks of the redeeming love of God in the end. That at the end of it all, God will be in control. So, what mindset do we have? A mindset that speaks the truth and tells the truth plainly without watering it down. Secondly, but giving hope, pointing out ways and means how we can overcome the negatives of the present time. So we do not only uh, we do not only make a critique; we also propose solution, and the solution must be that which is consistent with the will of God. Thank you. Thank you, Father Jonathan. Our next question is from Mr. Leo, is for Mr. Leo Ocampo from Jules of Quezon City. It is true that in time of pandemic and difficulties, we need to fo fix our eyes on Jesus. But a lot of times, it is difficult to read Jesus in the New Testament. Sometimes reading him brings in the bias of the reader and interferes in looking at him. Mr. Leo? Uh, I, I, I can relate with the explanation, uh, with the observation. Po, no? uh, it's difficult to read the New Testament. Uh, sometimes you feel like you need a lot of, of inputs to be able to understand it correctly, and that's true. No? Uh, you don't just read the Bible and interpret it anyhow uh, you want it. You need to know the world behind the text, Sabi nga ni Father Kanina, no, the world of the text, and also to be able to apply it to your own uh, situation at the moment. So, kailangan ng proper interpretation po, kumbaga. No? Uh, otherwise, we're not just uh, understanding the Bible, but minsan parang we impose our own meaning on the Bible. No? To understand the Bible, exegesis, pero yung iba, uh, pinoforce nila yung understanding nila sa Bible, ICGCs no which is not 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 good no isa na maunawaan mo si Jesus uh, baka ang mangyari eh mag ma distort pa lalo yung understanding mo pero ang ang assurance natin dito if we are sincere in understanding the New Testament meron po tayong resources no like WordCon mm -hmm. uh, I think that's the importance of activities like this to get to know the scriptures better. Mm -hmm. uh, marami rin tayong books. No? Mm -hmm. Hindi siya nagbibenta yung Clarision, <laughs> pero uh, Clarision Publications offers a lot of local and important yes. books to help us understand the scriptures better. Mm -hmm. We can also ask help from our priests and also our uh, biblical scholars. So help is available. Mm -hmm. uh, hindi naman tayo nag-iisa sa pag-interpret ng scripture. And of course, the best help always is the Holy Spirit. So we need to pray to the Holy Spirit to help us understand uh, the sacred text. So yun, uh, good luck sa pag-aaral ng 
uh, scriptures, I hope that you will have a pleasant and meaningful spiritual journey. Oh, salamat, Father Alex. Father Jonathan? Eh, Father Alex, uh, Mr. Yeah, Mayor. and I will, I will invite also our biblical scholars yes, here. Okay. No? <laughs> I probably would like to add more to the excellent answer that this is where teaching authority is most important. That we just, we just don't rely on our own personal interpretation. There is somebody that guides us. That's why the church, our mother, has this authority to teach us and teach us well so that we will not have many interpretations or many variations of our Lord Jesus Christ. As what happened in the past where there were various sects arising. So if you think that Yung mga sekta is a new phenomenon, you're wrong. Even in the first 100 years of Christianity, there were already many sects trying to mangle the person of our Lord Jesus Christ according to their own personal interpretation. That's why the church realized we need to have a central teaching authority. And this is good in our church because we only have one teacher. Okay? And everyone will learn that this is our way of looking at Jesus Christ. And so, we might have differences still. As Father Alex said, sometimes we emphasize the high Christology, sometimes we emphasize the low Christology, and then we fight over it. But at the end of the day, the guidance of our Holy Mother Church means a lot because it gives us a steady understanding of who Jesus Christ is. Thank you. Thank you, Father Jonathan, for that reminder. Father Alex, would you like to add? No. Father Anthony? No more. Okay. For our next question, for Father Alex from Joe of Davao City. The letter to the Hebrews proposes a radical mindset of the prevailing church structures. In the letter to the Hebrews, it is the Jewish temple, the high priest, and temple sacrifice. Does this presentation allow accommodation for new ways of liturgy that may, may be the new standard? It's indeed a very challenging uh, question and proposals. No, you have already included there some proposals about of of how do we deal with uh, sacred space, sacred person, and public rights, no, and calendars and all these things. Well, the, the, the letter to the Hebrews was a response to a very concrete need. You know? And we have seen of some of those uh, needs alive today. You know? And I would like to just to say that um, during the time of, uh, of the book and its community, it's around 90 to 96, didn't have much idea of Eucharist as we are having it now. No? So there, that's why uh, the, this lack of uh, sacred spaces, time, and sacred agents are, are very, very strong in that time. And what we can learn is that the, the author of the book of the Hebrews was not in a hurry of uh, proposing uh, proposing uh, strategies for social interactions or faith interactions or uh, proposing a lot of things but he started with mindsets as you were saying reframing it you know, in order that we are able to respond to a very concrete need and I was telling as I was telling that most of the paradigm shifts in theology and ever and even interpreting scriptures are triggered by historical events and this is a very strong historical events that we have to to attend to and we shall we, we should be open and welcoming no? uh, this is not to take away the Eucharist but rather to see to reframe our faith to reframe to see other dimensions creatively especially in times of difficulties Thank you, Father Alex, for that enlightening statement. Okay, our next question is for Father Anthony from John of Quezon City. Is the online Mass still a valid Mass when community is part of the celebration and validity of the celebration? 
the answer would be yes. The online mass is still valid, uh, but my point in my reaction is that there are people who even are told that the mass is still, va is still valid, but they have this feeling of incompleteness. Sabi ko nga kanina sa Tagalog pa, sabi nila, iba pa rin ang totoong misa. We are dispensed from attending the physical mass, but for those who are lucky to have a, an advanced uh, reservation, they can go. But how about those people, especially the senior citizens and the youth? No? So still, the mass is valid online. Thank you, Father Anthony. You know that question has been asked repeatedly throughout this uh, quarantine situation. For Father Jonathan, from Sister Esper of the Carmelite Missionaries of Davao City, the image of a new heaven and a new earth has been used by other sects to attract followers. There's a danger of this with many interpretations to gain influence of others to believe in their distorted faith. How could we address this problem, Father? Uh, okay. I think the strength of the sect is that they bank too much on apocalyptics, the fear of the people, that the end of time will come, and therefore they provide cheap solutions for salvation, something which the Catholic Church will never do. Because although salvation is free, still we have to be ready to receive it. So the burden is on the person whether he can receive or she can receive it or not. But for the sects, there's no problem. Just proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord and you will be saved. So I call it cheap salvation because it can be readily bought. I think that is their strength. No? So they come from an idea of punishment, which is a wrong interpretation of apocalyptics, and they provide a solution, just proclaim Jesus Christ is Lord or just be part of our group and you will be saved. So how do we combat this? First, we need to give people a good catechesis. On what does the Bible say on the end of time? That the emphasis is not on punishment, but on redemption, where everything will be recapitulated in Christ. The great Pauline vision where everything will be all in Christ. And that means righteous people need not fear. Only the wicked should fear. Because in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the faithful are even asked to, are even asked to stand up, raise, up, raise your head, because your salvation is near. So we have to emphasize this latter part of Apocalyptics, which is about hope redemption, reconstitution of the whole of creation, bringing it back to its pristine form. That's why there will be a new heaven and a new earth. So what we need is really a good and sound evangelization to the people that are being led astray by these, uh, by these other groups who, uh, who weaponize the, the apocalyptics. Let me just give a remark on the previous question from the point of view of history, of course. No. Uh, liturgy is organic. No, it developed. In ancient times, you remember the ancient Christians, they worship in secret. And that is why they developed the Domus Ecclesiae or the house churches. And that is not the sacred space that you are used to. But when... Christians become strong under the sponsorship of Constantine, we made use of the public space of the Romans, the Basilica, and turned it into a space for worship. So now people can gather openly on a magnificent building and worship God. But there are moments when Christians are persecuted, that public space is not around, even priests are not around, the community survived because they continue worshiping God in any way that they can, and they are very, very creative. 
they can do away with sacred space, with sacred ministers, okay, with sacred, uh, you know, and other uh, technologies of liturgy. But they could not give up their faith. And that is why they try to make use of everything. At the present time, when we have masses online, that's a new accommodation of our faith. Some of us are used to being present in the church, and sometimes it is driven by generation. We are brought up to go always to the church, but the young generation fits perfectly well with the new technology. So those of us who lament might be of the latter generations. The new generation has no problem. And therefore, there is hope okay, that even if the new form of worship would continue to be like this, the faith will continue. We might lament because we have lost something, just as the Israelites did when they lost their temple. No? By the rivers of Babylon, we wept because they could not anymore worship in the temple of Jerusalem. But the new generation, they, 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 uh, no, they move on, invented new forms of worship to the Lord. So the resiliency of the human spirit is there. Creativity is there. So we have high hopes that everything will continue, but a new generation of worshipers will come. Thank you. Thank you, Father Jonathan. Very enlightening. Okay, for any of our speakers or all of our speakers from Arvin Lising of Quezon City, I am thankful that this set of reflections gave a grounded basis as we are called as Christians to rethink and reframe our being church with Father Jonathan providing church history and Father Alex providing biblical grounding. With these, I have two questions in mind. One, how do we engage those with populist faith who cannot get away from the worldview of traditionalist liturgy that seems to limit the faith expression in rituals and thus not seemingly coping with the limitations set by the quarantine? And two, in our liturgy and proclamation, how do we bring the mindset of the resurrection from people who seem to be stuck on the suffering of the cross or even saturated with its message with the Christ and Church of the Hebrews and apoc in apocalyptic literature. Anyone? Mr. Leo, would you like to begin? Uh, medyo mayaman yung, yung tanong ni Arvin, ni Arvin wow. of Quezon City. No? And uh, sige, isa-isahin natin. So how do we engage those who cannot get out of the traditionalist mindset? Siguro hindi siya dapat end or yung approach. No? Hindi naman ibig sabihin na may online mass, we forget the value of the physical mass. No? Lalo ngayon, we are in a very crucial time kasi uh, allowed na yung mass, pero hindi pa rin obliged. No? So, uh, yung mga tao ba makokontento na lang sa online mass kahit na physically able to go to mass? No? Uh, should we uh, settle for substitutes, kumbaga. Kasi malinaw naman sa simbahan that this is not the normal thing. No? Actually, si Pope Francis, when uh, inalaw na yung mga physical masses sa Italy, he sees uh, having his masses broadcast. No? Uh, kasi gusto niya emphasize that real worship involves real community. Uh, the sacraments involve physical signs, mm -hmm. sensible signs, no? uh, and uh, kailangan malinaw sa atin na yung online, as far as the church is concerned, is not the, the full mass. No? Sabi nga ni Father, ano po yan? Yung totoong misa. No? Uh, hindi ito yung totoong misa. Kumbaga, no? uh, in, in, a, in a limited way, uh, may grasyang dumadaloy doon, pero hindi ito yung ideal. No? Uh, that's very clear. So, uh, to cope with the pandemic does not mean forgetting all of these uh, important things in our faith. Mm -hmm. Sacraments, community, no, gathering, and uh, all of that. Pero at the same time, no, uh, pinapa, sinasabi nga natin dito sa word code, kailangan responsive din tayo sa challenges ng panahon. So, balance po yun. No? Uh, 
we preserve our tradition pero at the same time nag a po tayo and magandang sinabi ni Father Jonathan that this is the church's way of reaching out no? uh, mm-hmm. at marami siyang throughout the generations uh, yun siguro yung lesson ng church history laging may paraan ang Diyos sa pamagitan ng simbahan na maabot yung mga tao no? according to their need and their situation. So, kailangan ng openness, yeah. pero at the same time, we do not forget no, to be grounded in our tradition. Second, uh, how do we bring the mindset of the resurrection from people who seem to be fixated with the cross? Uh, magpo-promote na po ako ng aking libro. No? Uh, <laughs> yung libro ko sa Clarician ay Via Lucis, no? uh, Way of the Resurrection. And uh, in the i- intro, I shared yung kinuwento sa akin ng isang seminarista. Sabi niya, pumunta daw siya sa Holy Land. Mm-hmm. Tapos may kasama siyang Orthodox. Mm-hmm. At the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, tinanong siya nung Orthodox niyang kasama, why do you Catholics go here? Sabi niya, it's, this is where the Lord was crucified. This is where the Lord died. Sabi ng Orthodox friend niya, oh, we go here because this is where the Lord rose again. Diba? Uh, parang nag- nagulantang siya kasi ah, yung emphasis na mga, namin mga Catholics, no, parang laging may cross kahit saan, magadosal ka laging may sign of the cross no? but again, this is not an end or reality hindi ibig sabihin na we emphasize the resurrection, we forget the cross laging uh, ang sabi nga sa Latino per crucem ad lucem no? through the cross to the light You cannot reach the light if you do not go through the cross. Kaya uh, gustong-gusto ko yung reflection ni Father Alex. Di ba sa letter to the Hebrews, bago si Kristo naging high priest, before he was elevated to the level of the angels, no, he had to go down, he had to become man, no, and to learn obedience through what he suffered, and being thus perfected, no, to become the great and merciful high priest. So may halaga po yung cross. No? Kaya nga, siguro yun yung value na pinopromote ng simbahan. But at the same time, we do not lose sight of the glory. That is, hindi, hindi nga lang promised, eh, already assured because Christ is already victorious. Yun din naman yung sa apocalyptic literature. No? Lilindol, guguhu lahat, no? magugunaw, pero no reason to fear because the victory is won. No? Uh, Christ is already risen. Thank you, Mr. Leo. Father Anthony? To add on that, uh, in my experience in the parish, most of those who share with me their struggle to uh, to accept or to have this f- a kind of feeling of incompleteness, they are mostly senior citizens who are forbidden to attend the physical mass. And I guess this is a great challenge for pastors, for priests, for Bible scholars like Father Alex, and uh, the things that he are that that he's doing, you know, yung kaya mga project on projects online, and the historians, Father Jonathan, and all of us here, you know, we are challenged uh, to give a solid formation and to cater to these people. You know, how can we? Uh, make them um, think or realize that there is a need to go out of the physical church at this point. Mm-hmm. No? So, hindi pwedeng dun lang lagi tayo. And how can we help them reframe the church in general? No? So, the, the idea of the church and the liturgy. So, malaking gampanin para sa aming lahat mm-hmm. ngayon. Kasi yun karamihan ang mga tao na nagtatanong at may duda doon sa online mass. Oh, tama. Tama, Answer. Father. Salamat, Father Anthony. Father Alex. Okay. Uh, maraming salamat, Arbs. <laughs> at kumusta dyan sa St. Therese College. <laughs> okay. Um, reframing is not easy. Okay. Um, we have to accept that. That even Vatican II, we're still struggling so much now. Okay. And reframing is not so easy, especially when it touches to something very dear to us. Yes. Liturgy and worship and all these things. No? So, but uh, we cannot also you know, just stop. I mean, we, of course, when the author of the Hebrews 
I suppose he was a leader and a disciple in the letter of the Hebrews. He was cited to be somebody who has an authority to teach, to, to guide. No? And uh, I think he, was, uh, he met also a lot of uh, people who were scandalized by his writings. No? And I, I suppose he had a lot of troubles also of expressing his, uh, his reading, his reframing of Jesus in, 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 this, uh, in, a, in a difficult moment. No? But I think uh, that's, uh, that remains a challenge for us. We simply have to move on mm -hmm. because we cannot, uh, we cannot stay, we cannot get stuck to, to this kind of you know, reality. And that is our, that is our uh, job, that, uh, especially uh, teachers, theologians, as Father Anthony was saying. Um, of course, uh, Jonathan was saying that, of course, there is a central, uh, you know, uh, guidance from the, the central, especially in, 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 in interpretation of the, the scriptures, but we have also a, a, an obligation to, to move forward. You know? And I would like to emphasize that in the letter of the Hebrews, the sacrifice of praise is placed side by side with koinonia and iopoia, with uh, kindness and sharing. You know? And oftentimes, yung iba kasi, uh, oh, sige, nagsisimba kayo, ay ako tumutulong, or yung iba tumutulong, hindi nagsisimba, or something like that. No? I mean, uh, the, the Hebrews, uh, the, the letter to the Hebrews, uh, place this two dimension in one cultic ak. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's uh, the genius of it. I, I, I believe that's beautiful. And we're in, in this moment of difficulties, uh, calls us a lot of to be stronger in this. Uh, we can make our houses, our homes, to be the sacred space. No, uh, our ourselves can do the novena, the prayer, the, the praise uh, in our homes. No, and at the same time, do acts of goodness, generosity, and kindness. Yeah. Thank you, Father Alex. Father Jonathan. Uh, with regard to the first question on the traditionalist, the liberalist, and those in between, there is really a great call for us to embrace diversity because many of our faithful comes from different range. Yes. Okay? And therefore, we have to live with it because we could not demonize the traditionalist. They helped a lot in the preservation of our faith. If they did not insist on tradition, there would have been many things introduced in our church that would not have been in consonance with the teachings of Jesus Christ and the apostles. Mm -hmm. So we have to thank them for that. There are too many to enumerate historically, so I will not do that. Suffice it to say, they did the church a great service. On the other hand, those who enjoy more the freedom of the sons and daughter, of being a son and daughter of God, they also challenge the church not to get stuck only on tradition because we are moving forward every time. So how do we re-articulate our tradition? Not changing it, but just giving it new form that is more appropriate to the present time. So again, that is their contribution. That we are not fossilized or dried up realities, but a living, organic faith community. And so, we need to be comfortable with each other. Sometimes, we want them to be on our side. Now, that is the politics of faith, which is not supposed to be the case. If there is politics among us, it should be who could serve and love more. Not on the kind of, uh, of uh, way of seeing the faith uh, that we want to impose on other. So, if there are people who feels incomplete because they could not, you know, uh, uh, go to the physical mass, let us comfort them, let us try to help them provide what they need because they are an important part of the church. There are those who are more comfortable with the online mass. I remember the fight of a mother and a son. Mother wants to go to the church now that we have now, uh, you know, access to physical liturgies. Son said, no, I will stay here because I can participate more by myself online. <laughs> they were fighting. I told her, leave him be. Okay? You have your own worldview. He has his own worldview. But 
If you are consistent in your own worldview, he might be changed. Not by your talking, okay. but by your way of life. You seduce him by the integrity of your life. Now, the second question about us being focused on the suffering Christ, I guess it goes with our experiences of people. Okay? Before, we have many sufferings, right? We were conquered, we were ruled by others, we were in poverty at some time, etc. So, there is a generation of people who looks to the suffering Christ as their comforter and consoler because they think that Christ knows what they are undergoing. Just look at the Nazareno. It can command how many millions of devotees? Because they self-identify with the suffering Christ. And who are these? People who have real experience of suffering. But there is a new generation of Filipinos who have not who have very few experience of suffering because their parents have already got a good job they were you know raised up well with children psychology they are not terrorized by their parents so what are they these are the happy you know these are the celebrative christians you can see that in many new christian groups now the feast and any other you know Christ, uh, catholic christian groups they emphasize joy and happiness. Why? Their world have changed from ours. And therefore, there are people who are for the poor and suffering Jesus because of their experiences, because of the, of the shared mentality that they have heard from their parents. And there are generations now who are more celebrative because they entered into a world that is not suffering anymore but full of possibilities. So, we cannot say to the people who love the suffering Christ to change, level up, because that's how they touch God. But, we can also allow these celebrative new Christians to express their faith in a more joyful manner, in a more, uh, you know, more emphasis of the light rather than darkness, because both are valid ways of touching God. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Perhaps the celebratory aspect no, could be the one emphasized these days because there's so much suffering on almost all levels. Yeah? Okay, again, for any of our panelists, from Claret Perez, from uh, FB Page, Be a Clarician Missionary. Scriptures can be interpreted in various ways, metaphorically, experientially, or theologically, or contextually. But what is the most effective way to connect scripture to the everyday lives of the faithful? Okay, Mr. Leo, ikaw ang sumagot. Mahirap pong umimbento ng sagot, so bumalik tayo sa CCC at kay uh, <laughs> ano po no, Vatican II. The best way to understand Scripture is to understand it with the help of the author of Scripture, who is the Holy Spirit. Uh, okay. So, kailangan lagi yung primacy of the spiritual uh, dimension in reading the Scriptures. We may have all the technical knowledge, pero kung wala yung connection sa Diyos, uh, you cannot understand scriptures correct, properly. Correct. So, ang foundation talaga niyan more than any scholarship no, is a relationship with God. God. Diba? Uh, lahat ng tao may kanya-kanyang paraan ng pagsasalita. Mm -hmm. no? uh, and you have a tendency to misinterpret someone if you do not know mm -hmm. the context of the yes. person, his manner of speaking, speaking. his way of relating. No? Uh -huh. So, makipag-relate sa Diyos. No? Kung meron mang may advice na if you want to know the scriptures, know personally uh, the author of the scriptures. So the talaga yan yung foundation yun talaga, know God. Opo, no? opo. Okay. otherwise technical lang ang magiging okay. knowledge mo. Kilala pero hindi mo siya kilala. Mm -hmm. Ang kalabas, kalabasan mo yan, stalker. No? Uh, <laughs> you know so many things about the person but you don't have a relationship. Yes, correct. So, Nakatakot po yung stalker. <laughs> <laughs> Salamat, uh, Leo. Father, Jonathan? Yeah, I'll give a more, uh, you know, below the ground, you know, <laughs> uh, answer. 
Well, first, because the scripture is a you know is a book, our sacred our sacred book. But at the same time, it also interacted with humans. Now, humans wrote it. Yes. We believe that they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. That's why we call them canonical. But how do we interact with the scripture that it will make us more engaged? First, you have to know who you are. I look back in history. Okay, there are many. Uh, ways that a person approaches the scripture and it depends on our mental processes mm -hmm. it's biological mm -hmm. so rather than going up to the spiritual know yourself first there are people who likes you know historical context you know and you know the sociological aspect of the text and in history there was a school that was developed to look at scripture that way the Anchukin school, who interprets scripture in the grammatical, historical way. Now, that's a way of thinking. And to put it, it's a, it's a left brain thinking, no? logical, sequential. There are people who are in love with scripture because of its beauty. For example, the description of St. Paul of love is very, very poetical. So they are attracted to the scripture because of its uh, of its literary beauty and in history another school arose that looks at the literary aspect of scripture and that would be the alexandrian school now it uses the right brain which is the creative brain and so it is important for us to know where we come from are you the type who uses the left brain or are you the artistic type who uses the right brain if you know yourself, then you can engage the scripture in ways that is consistent with who you are. Now, just a caveat, it doesn't mean that because you are in the grammatical or in the, in the creative way of looking at scriptures, you're going to be okay. Remember that many heretics were produced by both schools. Okay? Arios, Nestorios. Yeah, the early heretics, yes. now these are not bad people. Huh? Uh -huh. These are thinking individuals. You have to give them respect. They think, only that it falls short from what mm -hmm. is the real understanding of the nature of Jesus Christ. So, you have your own way of looking at scriptures, but you still need the guidance. The guidance of the Holy Mother Church. Now, I think we are given the way to debate, to propose you know, our own interpretation. But that is among us, until a consensus emerge, it is a personal opinion. It is encouraged because it is from there that we get truth later on, the engagements of minds. It is only when you are so sure that yours is the true interpretation and begin to disseminate it to others that a new sect probably is going to be born. <laughs> <laughs> because you think that you are the vessel of truth. The truth is in all of us as a, as a community. So we need the communitarian discernment in order to have a correct understanding of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And if it is personal, it's only yours. Mm -hmm. If you share it with others, you might come across as being a fool. Mm -hmm. Because God is talking to you in a personal way it might come across as different from another person. Thank you very much. Thank you, Father Jonathan. Father Anthony. Whenever I give a talk on scripture, people would approach me and ask, Father, we don't have a background on the scriptures, but how can we make a sound interpretation of the text? Mm -hmm. And I would always tell them, you know, during our time, you know, uh, it's so difficult to study the scriptures because we need to enroll you need to be uh, uh, to be there in the theological school in order for you to uh, to know and have a background of the the entire scripture. But now, with the technology that we have, everything is in Google. So what I usually advise is, if for example you have a struggle or you're struggling with a particular text, then you can type it on on Google, Google. <laughs> and then exegesis <laughs> of the text. You will have now a, uh, a, an exegesis of that, the world behind the text, the world of the text, and now after having uh, those exegesis, 
then it's now your turn to reflect on that. Mm -hmm. What does it say to our present context now? Mm -hmm. So, yun nam po, uh, maraming paraan ngayon para matuto ng scriptures. Oh, tama yun. Yes. For those who are reading. Yeah. Oh, salamat, Father Anthony. Father Alex. Wala na ako may dagdag. Eh. <laughs> uh, siguro tingnan natin din yung bakit ka nag-aaral sa Biblia? I mean, uh, ano bang end game mo? Yung, uh, gano, ano bang purpose mo? <laughs> Mag-aaral ka ng salita ng Diyos or what? I, I think this is, pag sinabi natin pag-aaral sa Biblia, dalawang bagay. Yung knowledge, pag-aaral, at meron din tayong tinatawag na pagpupulot aral. Yeah. And I think uh, uh, if Jonathan would say about the, the difference of brains here, I would, I would also give light on these two dimensions. Yung pag-knowledge, eh di mag-aaral ka talaga. Pero kung ang endgame mo ay pagpupulot aral, I, you don't have to, you know, to spend too much time in the the first part, but rather go straight to the to the word and encounter Jesus and yun. Yeah. So, siguro yun clarify kung kubaga uh, Father Jonathan was saying you have to know where you are. Idadagdag ko don know what is your end game kung gusto mong uh, mapalalim ang pag-aaral mo sa Biblia. Oh. Thank you, Father Alex. Know who you are and know your end game. Okay, for Father Jonathan from Julius of Quezon City. Thank you, Father Jonathan, for your presentation of a God who is in control of all in this time. But how can we reconcile a God of love who allows man to suffer? Well, we have to define allow. Yeah. Because you are saying that if God is in control, He should be controlling of everything. Remember that we live in a world with its own physical laws. Of course, the author of the physical law is God, but it has its own independence. Now, it operates here. So, not all the time, God should interfere because when He suspends natural law, that's what we call miracle. <clears throat> and when he suspends natural law, something must be happening from another side because he stops it from here, so it must e express itself on other side. So that's why uh, God rarely intervenes. And if God, if you want God to intervene always, then you should have complete surrender, which probably we could not. We just want God to interfere in things that are difficult to us. So where did our suffering come from? Did it come from God? Did He invent it? Of course not. It is a natural process that occurred here on earth and probably with human intervention as well. So now you want God to stop it? But what if God will say, okay, surrender to me all your independence so that I can take control of the world and make it a better place. How many of us will do that? So in a way, the natural processes are there because they need to occur. And God does not interfere because it is natural. Now, if God chooses to, He creates a miracle that is extraordinary, a suspension of the natural law. And He does not do it every day. Why? Because the natural you know, a process should go on or else there will be chaos in the universe. If every time God intervenes, there will be an adjustment of the natural law, then there might be chaos uh, uh, later on. So, unless God takes full control of everything. Now, it will happen at the end of time because there will be a new heaven and a new earth and the new rule will be the rule of heaven, so everything will be okay. But as of now, I doubt it. If God allows suffering for the people, it is our own, uh, it is our own making. Probably God is hurt, 
but he could not he could not you know intervene in respect to our individual liberties because if he does that then we are not creatures anymore of free will but just robots of god thank you the operative word there is if because we do not know what god thinks no yeah thank you father jonathan for father anthony from her son of Quezon city i want to know if the spirit of the general instruction of the roman missal will allow the use of the ipad or other gadgets for the reading of the gospel by the priest i am not a liturgist but i'd like to answer that question okay um a priest once commented when we asked him to celebrate mass in our parish and we used the sambuhay and he told me you should change that one it should be the uh, the gos the the book of the gospels not the the sambuhay and i said yes i will do that but at the back of my mind i was asking what is more important the book or the word of god does it make the mass invalid so those were the questions that lingered on my mind and um yes uh maybe father jonathan can add on this uh, because he is also an expert of liturgy history of the liturgy um i remember when the ipad was introduced i've attended a concelebrated mass somewhere in mindanao and we were surprised when the bishop read the gospel and the homily he took out his ipad and we were wow high tech si bishop <laughs> and that was the first time when I ipad was introduced so it's a point for reflection also for for us especially for example in our uh, in our communities now we no longer use the breviaries no most of us are using the our own cell phones no and we have the applications no? so we read the liturgy of the arts through our mobile phones so maybe uh father jonathan can add on that no? father anthony father well historically the form of how we you know uh, we preach the word or read the word varied in ancient times i'm talking of the early christians when there was not yet a written scripture of the new testament they do it orally there is no book and perhaps when it was written they read the scrolls not the book of the gospel that we have now yeah they read the scrolls so it's a different form it's a book but it's a different form and later on when uh, you know they invented the folio no uh, they are able to create books that's how we have the present form of book that we have now and then when printing press was you know invented and remember the words before were written by hand when the printing press was invented it is now by blocks of letters so it changes through the years so what is wrong with an ipad now, the word remains the same even if it is through, an, uh, through various medium but i guess again there is the so-called you know tradition that we have to protect no? i am not advocating for the total eradication of our <laughs> books in the liturgy yeah. but i am also <laughs> open to new forms of expression <laughs> the, <reactions laughs> yeah, the publication will go down <laughs> <laughs> new ways, no, no, no. new ways of, uh, you know, of really accessing the word. It's not the form that is our problem, actually. You know. Our problem is at the heart that receives the word. So rather than spending our energy fighting over whether it's, it's right to read the, in, in an iPad or in, or in whatever form, let us concentrate of bring the word to the hearts of people so that they will be transformed thank you yeah thank you father jonathan father alex you want to add something may oras pa ba tayo sure, sure. <laughs> uh, naalala ko lang isang uh, experience sa colombia when i was working there 
in one city called Medellin. Um, we were uh, we were based there, but we had to to move um, different places. At one time, uh, I was uh, I was assigned to to celebrate the Eucharist somewhere, you know. And pagdating namin doon, nakalimutan yung yung lectionary. Hmm. Walang lectionary. Tapos sabi ko, sino bang may Bible diary dito? Tapos sabi sa akin, wala father dahil mga street people itong mimisahan natin. So wala wala talaga kami ng ano. Sabi ko, paano ito? Uh, anyway, pagdating na sa ano sa gospel reading wala kaming first reading wala kaming mapagkunan talaga eh kahit sa cellphone wala wala walang wala walang wala so pagdating sa gospel eh di, i was only reconstructing the text no uh, kunento ko yung i mean yung samaritan uh, the good samaritan that was the gospel so i started to i started to to tell the story. No? I think that was the idea of uh, Jonathan was saying in the first uh, stage of our liturgy, the re uh, readings were just, they were not readings, they were just kind of, you know, telling the memory about Jesus' life, no? It's among some apostles and all these things. And I was so surprised that aba yung pinagmimisahan ko, aba may alam din pala sila. Dahil yung may mga uh, nagpo-pose ako for dramatic, you know, <laughs> dramatic uh, effect, sumasagot sila. Eh, Father, you, 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 they really wanted to participate even in the proclamation of, of the gospel. And it was, it was beautiful. It was perfect. No? And then we were able to, as a community, reconstruct the story of how they heard it and how they hung on it as a word of God. And I think, yun nga, sabi ay, uh, we, we moved, we, we grow, we adapt, and siguro pag uh, gumagamit tayo ng iPad or uh, iPhone, pag nandito si Pedro, si Pablo, ay magugulat sila. Mm -hmm. But that's how we, we grow as a mm -hmm. church. And I think uh, we cannot rule out the, the spirit guiding us through this uh, changes also yeah especially during this pandemic times no? yeah thank you father alex for fa mr leo from rod of manila in many celebrations of the catholic church like popular devotions and festivities you have written about the easter celebration can we anchor these devotions in scripture to provide validity or can we continue this even without scripture basis. Uh, maganda yung tanong ni Rod, no? Actually, uh, when I write about devotions, I try to follow the spirit of the liturgical instruction, no? Meron tayong directory on popular piety in the liturgy, and according doon, popular devotions, sa Vatican to na mention din to, should be drawn up in harmony with the scriptures and in harmony with the sacred liturgy. So, Laging tripod yun. No? Uh, dapat based on scripture and in harmony with the sacred liturgy. Kaya nga, magbibenta ulit ako. No? <laughs> pag, pag dinasal niyo yung Via Lucis, laging may scripture, tapos may uh, reflection, and may prayer inspired by the prayer of the liturgy. So, laging magkakasama yung uh, tatlo na yun. So that our uh, devotion is an extension and a deepening of the liturgy and also uh, an extension and a deepening of our study of the scriptures. So napakaganda po nung uh, kanyang idea and hopefully uh, yung mga ibang devotions din natin ay ma-renew at ma-purify mm -hmm. in this method kasi yung mga uh, sinauna pong devotions medyo hindi pa masyadong rooted in the scripture. No? Uh, parang medyo nahuhuli tayo kumbaga uh, sa ibang Christian denominations. No? Sila naman, puro scripture. No? Mm -hmm. uh, tayo, minsan, kulang sa scripture. scripture. So, maybe, uh, that's a very good idea coming from Rod, if we could uh, root all of these things in the scripture. But, that does that mean na, uh, porke wala sa Bible, eh, hindi na valid. No? Mm -hmm. uh, we must always remember, in the church, may scripture tayo at merong 
uh, tradition. tradition. So, hindi naman lahat ng tradition natin eh, mahanap mo sa scripture. For example, the rosary, no? Mm -hmm. uh, sabihin ng mga ibang sekta, wala namang rosaryo sa scripture, no? But we Dominicans, we will say, pero may scripture sa rosaryo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, diba? If you pray the rosary, you are basically the, praying the gospel, yes. no? uh, and learning the life of Christ. So, yun, uh, balance din, but we don't have to be tied all the time as if uh, everything has to be justified or na laging nasa Bible ba yan, nasa Bible ba yan. Mm -hmm. uh, hindi tayo ganun. No? Uh, we are a religion not of the book, no? nasa CCC po yan, but we are a religion of the living word uh, who speaks to us in the word, written word, but also speaks to us in the church, in the tradition of the church, in the continuing magisterium of the church, in our personal experiences, and in so many ways, no? even in nature. So, yun lang po siguro for Sir Rod. Okay, salamat Mr. Leo. Father Jonathan, you want to add something? About? Or, ikaw na? Okay, sige. Sige, sige. For Father Jonathan, from Jose of Davao City, we read in the Old Testament of a God who is angry and punishes the enemy. How can we read the Old Testament to avoid reading a God who can be angry at me and punishes me. You have to read it holistically, yeah. not only by parts. <laughs> by no? parts yeah. Because it's true that there are passages presenting God as angry, but if you look at the bigger picture, always the end the end uh, you know the the conclusion is a God who opens a way for reconciliation. Yes, yeah. Like, for example, when God castigates Israel and punish Israel. I remember you when you were young, referring to Israel in the desert, now that they are pure and pristine in their faith, and later on they become a harlot, a yeah. prostitute, because they interact with other pagan people, they imbibe pagan practices, etc. So God laments that mm -hmm. and threatens punishment. But what is the end? Okay. Israel will become pure again. He, she will become my bride again. So there will always be restitution in the end. So an angry God is a piecemeal uh, reading of the Old Testament. It has to be read in, in whole. It's like reading as if you are a sectarian who only picks on the words that will benefit you, but do not look at it in its context. So, read the whole chapter so that you will understand that our God is a loving God and not a punishing God. Thank you. Yeah, Father Anthony. And you can use the image of a household or a family. Di po ba? Uh, yung ating mga anak, dinidisiplina ng magulang. Pero later on, as Father Jonathan said, no, andun lagi yung pagpapatawad, pagunawa. But uh, there should, they, they should be disciplined, you know sa konteksto ng family. So, ganun din yung picture ng Old Testament. Father? <laughs> ano pa yung dagdag ko eh. <laughs> Actually, kung statistically, pag-aralan ng Old Testament, ang mas maraming salitang lumalabas ay hesed, mercy. mercy. Uh, it's not punishment, it's not uh, chastisement, but uh, it's mercy. You know that the question has come out uh, frequently huh, during this uh, pandemic time, uh, an angry God, somebody who not only allows but who punishes. And maganda yung point ng Father Jonathan, eh, we have to look at the context. I remember in exegesis, di ba, we learn, uh, look at the text, and then look at the immediate context, and then the bigger context, and then the entire chapter or the entire book from where it comes from so that we understand that text no um are there any questions okay uh may shout out tayo sa participants and viewers from uh pasig cebu baguio quezon city pampanga paranaque caloocan davao pangasinan surigao bacolod tarlac oh we have people from new guinea Anyone else? Do you have your questions? I think you would like 
Yes, okay, father, uh, father tuloy. <laughs> Leo. <laughs> sige, yeah, sige. Uh, yung Angry God, no? Uh, parang Angry Bird tuloy yung dating. Uh, <laughs> correct, correct. Well, does God become angry? I, yung mga emotions kasi, no? Uh, we project emotions on God, no? Uh, this is an anthropomorphic thing, no? As if uh, God is angry, God is punishing, no? But uh, all of this no, has to be understood nga in the context of love. But love takes on different expressions. And uh, the best kind of love is when the expression is suited to the situation. No? Mm -hmm. uh, halimbawa, napapariwara yung anak mo, tapos tinotolerate mo. No? Uh, hindi yung tamang pag-ibig. No? Uh, ako yung mga studyante ko, minsan pag nagsastruggle but they are giving their best, ang ginagawa ko, pasang-awa. No, pero meron din akong inimbento ang tawag ko bagsak awa, no, yung <laughs> yung mga sujante na nagpapasaway na talagang nananadya, no. Sasadyain mo rin konting hilahin ng ganun para <laughs> matuto ng leksyon. So bagsak awa, no. Uh, and it's still awa, it's still love, no, but uh -huh. in the form of discipline, in the form of anger. But we do not say that God does not punish, no, because mm -hmm. God would be unjust if he does not punish, no. Uh, but his punishment is always an expression of his love. So tama nga yung uh, sinasabi natin na uh, holistic no uh, mm -hmm. reading of the scripture hindi yung patingi-tingi na titingnan mo lang yung ano I'd also like to comment yung punishment daw yung covid no uh, early on nung nagpandemic parang pinapanish daw yung yeah. mundo kasi yung si Pope Francis pinapasok yung pakamama doon sa oh, Vatican yeah. okay. no uh, and uh, mga heresy daw na uh, that that would narrow our understanding of God na and of nature na parang God is controlling everything. Ngayon sinasabi ni Father Jonathan, may mga bagay na nangyayari lang talaga no as mm -hmm. part of nature and it's also important to realize na yung inaakala nating minsan na suffering if you look at the bigger context of things no hindi pala siya suffering lang pero blessing no mm -hmm. uh, di ba minsan pag mainit gusto mo umulan no mm -hmm. pero mahalaga yung init at ulan sa mga farmers no kung puro ulan lang mm -hmm. ma malulunod yung mga tanim kung puro init lang matutuyo okay. no so what may be a suffering for you could be a blessing to others mm -hmm. kaya nga uh, kailangan minsan lawakan din natin yung ating pag-iisip. At yun ang invitation ng scriptures. Uh, sometimes the scriptures would mirror the narrowness of mind of the writers. And that's okay, no? Uh, inayaan yun ng Diyos para tayong babasa, hopefully, no, would be invited to a broader frame of mind in understanding all of these things po. Yeah. Thank you, Leo. Uh, any of our speakers want to add some more? Okay. <laughs> okay, a shout out to Batangas, Cavite. Okay, do you have any more questions? So in this uh, session today, mag mahalaga talaga ang scriptures and church history, no? Maraming dimensions. Ang dami ko rin, ano, take away from the logical and then the creative, no? And the tradition and the new ways that are coming out. Maganda nga itong pandemic uh, situation na to eh. Kasi we really uh, not only go back to our faith, but also look for new ways when we can live our faith dynamically. Di ba? Oh, it's a challenge yung mga scholars. Yeah, correct. Oh, to help naman the, the ordinary people, no? O oh, yung mga theologians. O oh. oh, may pahabol pa. Any habol from our audience? Okay, ay may pahabol pa. The let oh, sige, from Julius, ay J, sorry. J of <laughs> Quezon City. <laughs> sige. The letter to the Hebrews is a story of the people who moved away from the temple. Can this be read that the Protestants are right, Father? Well, um I don't know if it is very precise to say that the people who moved away from the temple. Um, in fact, they were searching, why do we, why, bakit wala tayong temple? Yes, yes, that's what uh, they were asking. Uh, that's the, the thing, uh, that's, yeah. the, the, that's the uh, status questionis ng mga, uh, the community of uh, 
maybe they have moved uh, away from the, the traditional Jewish temple, mm -hmm. but they were searching of their own sacred space, mm -hmm. no? And um, to relate that to the Protestant, uh, uh, you know, movement, uh, movement uh, mukhang hindi ata one-on-one uh, -on -one proportion yan. Yeah. Kasi nga ang Protestant movement ay may pinanggalingang yeah. history. Yes. No? And it was not really moving away from the temple, temple. but it's also finding their own sacred space. No? And in fact, that's a challenge for us na there are a lot of sacred spaces that actually still available. No? Uh, nga, sabi ko sa kanina, mga bahay natin, bakit hindi natin uh, simulan gawing sacred space? And in yeah. fact, the first Christian communities are very strong in that. No? Yeah. Kaya oh, sa kainan, sa, I mean, Ando na, lalo na ngayon na, nando na lahat, no? Yes. <laughs> hindi yes. makalabas sa SM, hindi makalabas sa ano, so nando yeah, lahat, ano? So there was also a collapse of, you know, personal space, but there is, it collapsed into a common space, no? Mm -hmm. you know? So there is the, the bursting, or new bursting, or new opportunity. But it's not simply, uh, we cannot immediately, uh, uh, place that into uh, with uh, you know yung kasi yung yung protestant movement it has its own uh, storyline yeah. no? correct okay, that's, okay. Uh, that's also a point to remember we cannot ask like that questions kasi protestantism arose historically no uh, out of the situation of that time yes but, uh, but it's very true that uh, the protestants use more of the phrase sacrifice of praise ah, okay yeah okay. They, they use that that you know, uh, ah, they that phrase that phrase you know, because of their worship is more geared to uh, for that no mm. but maybe we can learn from them yes. i mean precisely in these difficult times yun yeah yung reframing you know? mm -hmm. uh, yung reframing of our, our faith uh, our understanding and faith and but in his school na hindi lang hindi nagtapos yung phrase uh, sacrifice of praise ang worship acceptable to Yahweh ay dalawa yon yung sacrifice of praise and kindness and sharing as part of that cultic act yeah correct ah uh, Leo yes yan yeah, uh, <laughs> Gusto kong i-recall yung sinabi ni Father Anscar, no? What then is liturgy published by Claritian Communications? Of course, no? Uh, ayan, si Ma'am Aging umingiti na binibenta ko yung libro ni Father Anscar. Sabi niya, the altar is not made holy by the blessing, no? But mm -hmm. by the fact that the body of Christ is celebrated there mm -hmm. and the community is gathered mm -hmm. around it, no? Uh, ibig sabihin, no? Uh, any space kung saan uh, nagko-connect yung mga tao sa Diyos is potentially an altar, a temple. Kaya nga, uh, even our homes, no, sabi nga ni Father, could be places of encounter with God. And even cyberspace. No, siguro nahihirapan pa yung uh, mga traditionalist, no, even within the church, even Pope Francis himself to uh, understand cyberspace as space. No, pero it is a space. No, It is where people meet, ngambang eh, nag-word con tayo in cyberspace, no? Mm -hmm. The word of God is being proclaimed mm -hmm. and where two or three are gathered, di ba? Mm -hmm. There am I in the midst mm -hmm. of them. So, God is with us, no? As yeah. we are uh, studying His word in this conference in cyberspace. Kaya nga, uh, your, on, or your screen now is an altar. Yeah. Your screen is an ambo where the word is proclaimed and mm -hmm. the, the word of God is present. So, siguro yun yung uh, reframing na kailangang mangyari in terms of space. Now, does that apply to the Protestants? I, I, I guess so also, but uh, yung kung i-apply mo yung verse to them, I mean, yung medyo problematic, sabi nga ni uh -huh. Father Alex. Because in the first place, uh, kailangan isipin mo yung chronology. Wala pa namang mga Protestant churches noon. So, <laughs> hindi pa na-imagine yun ng author. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Leo. Oh, may pahabol pa? Now, isang question. Okay, one last question from uh, Dolly Zafra from our Facebook page, Word Conference, addressed to any of our speakers. 
Our new generations, usually struggling with depression, who turn into suicidal actions. Why do you think this happens now? How can our church help? Father Jonathan? It always happens. Every time there is a stressful, uh, you know, happening in society, there will always be mental health problems. <clears throat> it's not a new phenomenon. Even the people of God before, they suffered. But what made them resilient is their adherence to the promise of God, that God will take care of them, that everything will come to a beautiful conclusion later on. That's why Israel was resilient. Imagine how many thousands of years that they were scattered all over, yet they maintained their identity. What kept their identity? It's their adherence to their belief in God. So, what is the church doing? The church was doing something. But sometimes the church is hindered by the restrictions set uh, set because of the of the pandemic no? and as much as the church wants to minister to the people who suffer mentally yet there are things that they could not do because it will violate civil law they opened up many uh, opportunities for you know counseling etc virtually but I guess some people could not be satisfied only by being heard they wanted to see people. They wanted to, uh, you know, uh, they wanted to interact with warm bodies. But again, this has been hindered, and that is why the church also was impaired. You know? But that was a reality that we have to take because we live in a world with its own set of rules, and we have to abide with it so that we will not complicate things too much. So, I guess, uh, how can we comfort people with mental problem? By showing them that somebody is willing to listen. By making them realize that this is not just an occurrence now. It happened in the past and people survived. They move on with their lives. There are many stories of people who have shown grit during these trying times. And therefore, they must also shore up their own courage to face the problem of today and then thirdly if we can bring them to an appreciation of faith because even science tells us people with faith they are more resilient they are happier they live longer lives okay no matter what the propaganda of those who are against faith no? faith is scientifically proven to give you groundings in moments of difficulty and therefore that's probably another central job of the church to remind people to keep faith thank you thank you father Jonathan any of our speakers want to add something more yes Leo. Uh, siguro yung mahalaga din to understand mental health no uh, hindi lang ito dahil walang hope yung tao no this could also be rooted in biochemical factors so kung kailangan ng professional help, kung kailangan ng medication, kailangan din po talaga yun. No? Uh, meron kaming mga students na nag-encounter ng ganito and may, nakakalungkot kasi rimbawa yung isa, no? uh, sinabihan siya nung kanyang teacher, hindi ka kasi nagdadasal. No? And the person was struggling in his faith. No? Uh, yun nga, nagdadasal siya pero wala siyang uh, nakukuha dun sa kanyang pagdadasal. No? Uh, nag-try siyang mag-reach out sa mga tao pero mas na-frustrate pa siya when uh, the, pag nag-reach out siya. So, kailangan uh, unang-una, maintindihan niya kung ano yung nangyayari sa kanya at magpatingin siya sa, sa doktor. Okay. No? Uh, yeah. Seek professional help. Okay. Salamat, Leo. Uh, with this last question, we wrap up this WordCon Sala. WordCon 2020 Sala. And I'd like to thank Father Jonathan Bitoy, Father Alex Gobrin, Fa uh, Mr. Leo Campo, and Father Anthony Carion for joining us today. And of course, all of you on uh, Zoom, on YouTube, and on Facebook Live. Thank you for joining us.
much, everyone. We'd like to announce the winners of our raffle for the second day of Word Conference. The winners of One Bible Diary 2021, Justin Mark Lim, Elaine S. Del Rio, Isa Maka Laging, John Carlos Sola, and Niel Malishen Pal- Palalia. Congratulations to our winners of One Bible Diary. Thank you very much, everyone. That concludes our Word Conference Online 2020. We'd like to thank our distinguished speakers and reactors for the inspiration that they have given us today. And of course, we'd like also to thank all of you, hopefully, that you have received God's Word in your lives as we continue to offer a sacrifice of praise through the inspiration of the letter to the Hebrews. We hope to see you next year. Our Word Conference 2021 will revolve around the theme, Word and Mission, as we conclude the 500-year celebration of Christianity in the Philippines. Again, we'd like to thank our media sponsors, Like Us News, Veritas 846, Philippine Daily Inquirer, CBCP News, the Diocese of Cabal, and CBCB ECMA. Of course, we'd also like to thank our different partners in the social media who cross-posted this event, Claret School of Quezon City, CBCP News, the Association of Major Religious Superiors in the Philippines, Catholic Educational Association of the Philippines, Immaculate Heart of Mary Parish, Father Fiel Pareja, the Servants Chronicles, Seminarista Ni Cristo, He Said, She Said, PH, Hugot Seminarista, the Capo Church, the Clarician Missionaries of Philippine Province, Be a Clarician Missionary, Hominis Clarishano, the 75 Years of Clarician Presence in the Philippines, Word Links, Claret Youth Ministry Philippine Province, and the Claret Seminary Philippines. Again, thank you very much. Hope to see you on the next Word Conference 2021.